Okay, hello everybody. Uh, hello to Nathan, hello Kirsten. Hi there, Patrick. Hey. So uh, we, this is the, uh, this is three of the four people who do Metro Conversations in the past. We are city councillors from around the Lower Mainland and we have uh, talked a few times about, about cities and about how our cities are operating and, and our lives sort of being city councillors. Um, and we decided to do a Zoom meeting because everybody's doing Zoom meetings right now. That's the new reality. But we thought it'd be interesting to have a bit of a chat because we haven't really had a chance to catch up with each other about what's going on with the uh, ongoing pandemic emergency. So uh, I don't want to give too much intro. Um, the fourth person is Matt Bond from the District of North Vancouver. He, he at the last minute cannot be here because like many others out there he is uh at home working at home raising kids and trying to manage a family in the house and it just one of those family emergencies came up trying to get kids to bed i think and so he had to drop out at the last second however please introduce yourself kirsten sure um so my name is kirsten duncan i'm a two-term counselor of the city of maple ridge uh very excited to be a part of this um and been invited by my colleagues to participate tonight. Uh, it's been definitely interesting um, working as a city councillor and in today's day and age, it's very different. Um, I'm certainly adjusting to it, so I'm very curious to hear what it's like for my colleagues as well. I'm from Maple Ridge, uh, that's my home community, and I'm very interested just to hear what my colleagues have to say and, and how they're adjusting to it. Nathan. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Councillor Nathan Bahal on the City of Langley, just on the other side of the Golden Ears Bridge um, from Kirsten. So yeah, it's definitely been um, something that I don't think any of us have experienced and hopefully we'll never have to experience again. Certainly the role of local government has shifted and I know our priorities changed in a matter of four days. So we're in a different world, different priorities, and it's just, I think uh, actually where I work said, instead of thinking a quarter ahead or a year ahead, you're thinking until the end of the day. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'm Patrick Johnstone from the city of New Westminster. And uh, again, a city councillor in the beginning, it just still feels like the beginning of the second term, but uh, the election also seems like 15 years ago now because of the way time has changed these days. So I just want to, before we get into our lives in the city. Tell me, like, what, what how are you doing? <laughs> like, how is your lifestyle right now? How are you, I mean, are you working from home? Are you, like, how, outside of the council life? What's your life like, like right now, Nathan? Uh, well, I've been spending a lot of time here at the kitchen table because I've been working from home for the past month right now. Uh, life is obviously a lot um, smaller, I guess I would say living in the city, it's nice that at least I can walk to the grocery store and take a walk and not run into a whole lot of people. But definitely, it's really been interesting not leaving a, about a two kilometer square radius. Wow. Kirsten, are you working? So outside? it's, yeah, it's, it's been kind of interesting for me. Um, I've been off work uh, for my second job teaching first aid for a while now, and that's because I was in a car accident last May. So I've been working from home um, a lot recently, like everyone else is, but I've been home a lot more this past year than I would typically be, and that's because of the accident. So it's not a huge shift for me in that respect. I'm accustomed to being at home and uh, doing my emails and phone calls from home. So that's not too bad. Um, what is very different for me is I'm used to doing a lot of running around. I'm the one in my house that does all the errands, that goes and does all the grocery shopping and picks up the dog food and uh, delivers anything we need to and, and everything else. And so not being able to go out and go shopping and um, go places like I usually would uh, is very restrictive. And not that I'm complaining, I'm not. I think the measures that are in place are really important for our safety. Um, but it, it does very much feel like you're being confined into a small space when you're not able to do those things anymore. Um, and the, the biggest impact for me, unfortunately, is that I can't go to a lot of doctor's meetings and medical appointments that I used right. to because I've got health conditions, I have a disability, um, 
I have chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And so for me, I regularly go to doctor's appointments and I am in the process of getting some testing done. And that's all been canceled because of the new provincial government regulations, which I understand why. And I think I'm very fortunate with the position I'm in because my position isn't as serious as other people, but I I definitely feel it because all of a sudden my healthcare plan has just stopped and it feels like I'm standing on the edge of a cliff and there's, there's no guardrails and it's the, the floor is just suddenly dropped off and I'm left with no answers and no idea what path to take and and what direction to go and yeah. what the next steps are because it's all up in the air. And I'm just fortunate that, uh, I'm not as seriously off as I was when the accident first happened and comparatively to a lot of other people that have had surgeries canceled or missed appointments or they can no longer get a CT scan or MRI. You know, I consider myself fortunate to be where I am, even though I've got challenges um, because it's really, really hard for the people that have been medically impacted by this and they're the ones that you don't hear about and you don't see because they're held up at home and probably have been before this quarantine because of their health conditions so that's been the biggest shift for me is is trying to adjust to that and and figure out with my doctors what do i do next if i can't get testing x done or you know what what next steps are there if i if i can't go see dr a or specialist b because of the quarantine they don't even know what the timing is at all. It's the worst part. You can't even say, we'll do it in two exactly. months or whatever, because you just don't know yeah. what the timing is going to be like. Exactly. Oh, sorry, to hear, sorry to hear that. That's, uh, that's a, it's, a, it's, it's hard to be in a, in sort of in a, in a, in a void, right? It's, that's the, the thing. It's just an information void. And that's the thing is we, we really have no idea. And, and the doctors are in the same boat. They keep saying, yeah. look, you know, we're here to support you. We'll do everything we can. But unfortunately, everyone is in the same position where yeah. we just don't know lo- how long this is going to last for. And there's just no way to tell. We have to take it each day at a time and, mm-hmm. and just hope that the measures the government have put in place are going to be successful if people yep. follow them, which I'm sure is something we'll be discussing today. <laughs> um, but we just got to hang tight, and wait yep. and see. Okay. Yeah. So how's council working? Maybe I'll, I'll go back to Nathan again. How, so <laughs> are, what does council work look like right now? Are you guys doing council meetings? Are you doing Zoom yes. meetings like this? Are you, are, and how are, you, how are you doing the decision making and stuff? Or, or how does that, well, how does I that think, work like, look like for you? I think in at least our municipality, the agendas have become much more concise. So it's just dealing with the bare minimum um, business if it's the long-term plan stuff has been a bit on pause right now because a lot of it's just dealing with like how do you get staff to work from home uh, discovering those policies how do you ensure essential services can happen especially if you lose like half your workforce um, things like that so we have had our first zoom council meeting last week so that was pretty good the one before that was a teleconference which wasn't very good because it's very hard to second motions when you can't see anyone. So it's good that at least you can do Zoom and that is public. Um, but it's certainly very different than an in-person meeting and you lose a lot of the dynamics around that. And it's definitely changed from, um, I guess, discussing and debating ideas to basically how can we deal with stuff effectively as possible and at the bare minimum as possible so that staff can be focusing on just dealing with this COVID response. Yeah, we've had, we've had a basically a meeting every Monday. Um, uh, we had a, you know, we had to actually have a one sit down council meeting where we had the bare minimum of people, four people in the room because we had to get through our procedure bylaw change in order to allow us to have an online meeting. So yeah. we had to do that, um, which was, which is very strange, but we now have had a couple of online uh, zoom meetings and, yeah, it's a strange dynamic, and uh, it's it's diff- it's just difficult to have a meeting in that sense because it's really. I mean, our mayor has done a pretty good job managing the, the managing Zoom and managing the um, uh, yeah the, the procedural part of it, 
but it's really hard to have a meaningful conversation through it, um, especially when you have staff in the Zoom meeting, you have not just the seven on council, but you have 20 people on there because a lot of managers yeah. are involved in those meetings in order to provide information if they're needed. And you um, can't see everyone at once either. Exactly. Uh, so, now, And the other side, the other part of it is, these are not our normal decision-making process to me. Like we usually, um, councils make decisions based on a lot of information and normally staff are there to give us a bunch of information and say, okay, we need to make decisions based on here's the data, here's the report. And the report has, uh, has, uh, you know, recommendations in it and here's the financial impact of that. And here's the environmental impact of that. And here's all the other impacts make your decision and we're here to answer questions. And now so much of the questions are, we just don't know, you know, we're going to try our best and we're going to try to move towards this. Do you think this is a good idea? It's a, it's very much more sort of gut reactions than it is uh, sort of analytical uh, uh, decision-making that that's a weird what's thing. Going, what's going on in Maple Ridge? Yeah. Well, uh, what's going on in Maple Ridge? Um, I'd say cautious not to get me, uh, how would I put it? Um, I can easily get started on a particular subject. We have um, something called uh, the Council Conduct Bylaw, Bylaw 7637-2020, that's coming before us. Um, if so you so want to discuss the most interesting thing that's before us, that would be the most controversial like thing on the table right now. But you're doing yeah, bylaws uh, like, that. like You're doing that kind of regular business. You're not just dealing with the emergency response. Yeah, that's right. And I've had a lot of concern from residents that we shouldn't be doing that, that we should be focusing on the crisis. And it's a tough call because we we need to keep moving forward as a government. We can't just stop everything we're doing. And it's not fair to the partners um, that are working with our government to just stop everything. If we're able to keep something moving and continue some level of normalcy, it makes sense to do that. But at the same time, I agree that we should absolutely be focusing on the crisis at hand. And I think one of the things we have to be very cautious of is if we do continue to move business forward, we have to make sure that people can still participate and be a part of that and the public is still involved. And that's one of the reasons this bylaw is so controversial is because it's it's detailing essentially what a counselor can do to another counselor if they're not following the rules. And it includes uh, counselors being hired to investigate one another. And I'm not making this up, this is real. Um, a counselor can have a problem with another counselor and then go to counsel and ask for a private investigator. That private investigator can be members of counsel who then investigate another counselor, write a report about that counselor and take it to a council meeting where that counselor, sub, the subject counselor is essentially tried and they decide whether or not to move forward with censorship. And there's, a number of other things in this bylaw we're supposed to agree to, which includes things like not talking to staff, um, hmm. which is a big red flag. Um, there's there's a number of different issues with it. Quite frankly, staff have said it's gone through legal. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, I think this bylaw breaks the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because it says one of the things um, that the mayor would have the power to do is to limit what civic facilities uh, a counselor can enter. You can take away um, any materials given by the city. So uh, phones and tablets, which they are labeled as convenience, which they're not, they're for work. And I'll say one more thing and then I'll leave, <laughs> <laughs> leave this to bed, I promise. Um, I think we're going to have another podcast about this. This sounds interesting because... Yeah. What, I, I think I've, we're well, going to, but... I've worked for a couple of cities before I was elected, and, and every city has its own weird sort of operations about how councils interact and how they have their own internal procedure bylaws, and they all interact with their staff in different ways. And there's yeah. strengths and weaknesses to all of, the, all of the sort of... to both ends of the spectrum, yeah. basically. But this sounds... Uh, well, it certainly peculiar. sounds far away from the COVID. Uh, yeah, yeah. Epidemic yeah. that we're dealing with. It's not urgent, that's for sure. Oh, wow, and it's not. Yeah, it's not a temporary but, measure because of this. This is a permanent change. 
No, exactly. This is a permanent change. And um, it's, in my opinion, it's a very strange bylaw. Uh, one of the, the last part I was going to mention, and I promise I will leave it to bed for now, um, but it even says in the bylaw that uh, it can restrict the information that is given to a counselor. So what that means, I don't know. Maybe we don't get to see our reports for the meetings. Uh, and it and it says um, that any anything the council deems uh, appropriate can be done to a member of council. So any punishment they deem appropriate, and it's just wide open. So we don't know what that is. That's just whatever the council deems to be appropriate. So I think oh. it's a terrifying, undemocratic bylaw. Um, definitely so open to having that discussion in a, so you're not in a future the conference, it. but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, hard hard to guess with me, I know, but um that's that's the most controversial thing right now before Maple Ridge Council and wow. I bring it up because mm -hmm. we should be focused on either daily business moving forward if we want some sense of normalcy yeah. um or important things that are relevant to the COVID discussion, but we have to be cautious that nothing is being snuck through and that the public has the ability and the opportunity to participate in any and all discussions coming to council and yeah. the scare of the public won't have that chance with this. Mm. Wow. So, so yeah, it's funny. I mean, our, our operations right now, like, especially the, from what the count, the council face of what we're doing right now um, is very much emergency response. And it's very much, uh, we have set the, staff very early on set up um, working groups. We have five working, no, seven working groups now. So they actually staff have reorganized around working groups to deal with different aspects of, of the pandemic. So, you know, we have a working group that's dealing with vulnerable populations specifically. We have a working group that's dealing specifically with business continuity and how we're gonna support businesses. We have a working group that's dealing with just of education and enforcement how are we getting the message out and how are we going to do enforcement and social distancing and stuff and that's really taken over a lot of the business in the, in the city right now there's a few sort of procedural items that we're still doing but when it comes to um public hearings or rezonings or talking about our uh, dog park uh, projects those have really taken a bit of a back seat right now to the emergency frankly well we don't even have really the measures to hold the public hearing yet so yeah um, we're waiting on guidance from the provincial government really a lot of what we're doing is just doing what the provincial government tells us to do right now um to be honest so they said you know operate your emergency centers i mean we started it beforehand but basically that's the the role and any advice we're getting it's from them uh, i don't know if we're going to cover it later but i mean the biggest concern is cash flow at the municipality. So normally tax will come out in the summer. There's talk about that happening in the fall. We also have no casino anymore, which contributes a large portion to our capital project. So with the casino closed, with um, tax bills suggested that they don't come into the fall, then there's gonna be how do we bridge that gap? Um, and then also with less revenue because Obviously, we'll probably be having a discussion on our tax this year. So less tax revenue, uh, less casino revenue, um, payments that might not happen in September. What's going to give here? Yeah. So we. So uh, budget is what keeps me up. What keeps me up at night right now. Uh, we are in a. Similarly, I mean, I'm sure Kirsten's in the same spot. We are in a cash crunch. Um, you know, a bunch of our revenue has just gone away. Casino revenue has gone away. We do get some casino revenue. Uh, you know, revenue for things like recreation programs and permitting and, you know, that's sort of a, a bunch of that, any of our non-tax revenue is gone away or is getting very much reduced. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little bit, for people who don't know about how local government works, I mean, we can't just, we can't print money like, like uh, federal government. And we can't really just borrow money for operations like a yeah. uh, like a provincial government. We have to have a balanced budget, essentially. What that means is that- And we can't go into debt. We're not allowed to. That's right. Yeah. Municipal governments are not allowed to go into debt. Right. 
yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so essentially, what happens every year for a city is that you know when those budget when that when that tax bill comes in when you pay your property taxes, that's a big cash injection for the rest of the year, and uh, we have to pay salaries. And there's always yeah. that time where if tax income is a little bit delayed, you get your cash is at the, at the bottom at the nexus, yeah. and we often do what's called a, a borrowing bylaw right around tax time, just in case we're a million bucks short on revenue or, or on salaries, you know, um, we have a bit of my cash to get us through that one month or two months until the tax yeah. bill comes in and then we're fine. So it's just like bridging financing almost. It's like, it's yeah, like it's a bridge loan. So we like, do yeah, that like, too. Yeah. It's like overdraft protection. So one thing we have done this year is we've, quadrupled our usual request or uh, um, authority to borrow for the bridge loan. So that means that New Westminster, for example, we, we are now authorized through bylaw to borrow up to $12 million to get us through that bridge. Let's hope it doesn't happen. We don't need that much money. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we were, we were actually going through a loan authorization process for capital projects for $50 million this year. Right. Uh, so that obviously is paused. We can't do an alternate approval process in this um, current state, right? So right. that's pushed back to at least 2021. Um, but I'm going to sound like a local politician here and say really the provincial and federal governments need to come to the table uh, and you know maybe they can expand the property tax deferral program. So at least the city gets the revenue, but people have the opportunity to defer. That means you still have to pay it, but you can yeah. defer it for zero interest until people can get out of this uh, crisis and then slowly pay that back. Because we, we, like, you, yeah, it's just uh, certainly there'll be some services we're not doing, like recreation services, and so there's cost savings there. But roads, water, sewer, all those things still operate. Uh, fire department, police services, and those are the largest expenses in our budget. So we shave a few, a few percentage points off, obviously, because of the reduction in recreation services and arts and culture, but I would almost guess that, and I don't know these numbers yet, that our emergency services are probably being higher, higher utilization right now, I would, I would guess. And hopefully because of the declaration of emergency, we'll be able to get compensated for some of those extra costs for emergency services, the people who are staffing the emergency mm -hmm. operations center. But um, you're right, it's this long-term capital financing is, is, all up in the air right now. We, we, we just don't know what our financial situation is going to be like in the fall. And prob I guess part of the problem being a, you know, being a local government person, you, the federal government and provincial governments are announcing these programs and saying, you know, we can, we're going to provide you support. We're going to provide you tax deferral or credits or something. They're, going to, they're announcing these financial incentives or, and financial protections. And people are asking local governments, well, why can't you do this as well? And it's like, we just, we don't have that, we don't have the liquidity. We don't have the money in the bank to do this. We, we need to continue to provide those essential services. And we just can't get extra money to do that. So it's a bit of a challenge right now with our, just how do we communicate that? Mm -hmm. People should know that your local government would absolutely love to do things like what the federal government is mm -hmm. doing right now. Um, with um with giving out money and trying to support yeah. people i mean we would love to be part of those subsidy programs and, and give back and help residents but we simply don't have that ability we don't have the finances to do it and we don't have the authority either so yeah. we can't if we yeah. could we absolutely would but we just can't that's what the federal and even provincial governments are for yeah. yeah, there's even the, you know some questions they ask. Well, why can't you give restaurants a tax deferral until December? It's like, well, we can't because number one, it would be very difficult for us to to manage the finances of that. But mostly, it's against the law. <laughs> we can't actually choose one type of business and say we're not going to charge you taxes for six months. That's that's a it, it's it's a difficult procedural thing to go through. So exactly. So if, I think if we could all defer taxes for a year, we would, but we can't. So hopefully the province will do it for us. Yeah. So what we're basically is much <laughs> like much like the deferral program you get if you're over 55 for your property taxes, you can essentially uh, 
you do, you apply to the provincial government to defer your taxes, and the province pays the city that tax money instead of instead of you paying it directly. You basically get a loan from the provincial government. Yeah, and the city. And I mean, pay it. another thing that no one's talked about is TransLink. So oh. I don't know how they're going to operate because they've basically seen the revenue disappear. Um, so they're running basically on reserves, I would assume, right now. So what does that mean? TransLink, much like a local government, can't just borrow money for operations. They don't have, and so um, they are burning through money right now, and it is really difficult. Uh, it's not just TransLink. It's every, every transit system across North America is, is in trouble right now. Um, TransLink perhaps worse than others because of all the transit systems in North America, TransLink has one of the highest, one of the lowest proportions of their operating income or operating revenue comes from property taxes or from taxes. Most of it actually comes from operations, fuel tax, and uh, parking tax, or mostly, mm -hmm. fuel, mostly fuel tax and operations. And those two revenue streams are disappearing, going away. So yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm really worried about what, how transit is going to manage that. I'm glad um, that's not my uh, file right now because it's, it's, it's a troublesome. Yeah, but it, and it does impact the most vulnerable people as well, right? So the people who rely on that right now are the people who have no uh, other choice. So those are the people who are, are um, modern day heroes right now, right? Whether you're working at the hospital or working at a grocery store, working in logistics. Yeah. Um, a lot of these people, this is how you have to get around. So if transit suffers, we all suffer. Yeah. So and that's an interesting term as well. Sorry, if I may, um, just the whole modern heroes concept. I, I find it a really interesting debate. We probably can't get into it today. Um, but the living wage debate, and we're, we're calling uh, people that are working in grocery stores and bus drivers are heroes, and yet so many of them don't make a living wage. And I I think that's this is a really good time to look at that and have a serious argument and say, well, at the end of the day, when society is falling apart, who are we relying on? Oh, right, we're relying on people that work minimum wage jobs yeah, and don't yeah. get the benefits and supports that they deserve and that they need. So that's another yeah. conversation I think needs to be had. Yeah, I don't well, want to take away from healthcare workers or first or first responders at all, but. We are realizing that there are a lot of it, that there aren't any unimportant jobs. <laughs> There's a lot of important jobs in our communities. And I'll actually add municipal workers, people who are working for the city, because our mm -hmm. city hall is still got people in there. They are doing that communications and that outreach because everyone's calling city hall to find out what we can do or, or if there's an issue going on or are we closing parks? Are we managing social yeah. distancing? What, do you, what is the city doing? That we have. And I want to get away from the, the choosing part as well, whether it's, yep. oh, well, they're better than or they're worse than health exactly. workers. That's not the conversation. <laughs> it's that they all deserve supports and services. It's yeah. not one is better than the other. One is working harder than the other. It's, it's not that we suddenly think grocery store workers are more valuable than healthcare workers. It's that they're both very valuable in our society. We greatly appreciate the work that they yep. do, and, and they both should be paid a living wage jobs and have benefits <laughs> and supports. That's what the conversation needs to be is, is not one is better than the other one and one is suddenly more important. It's just that they're equal and they're important and that we need to ensure those people are properly supported. Well, if there was a time to discuss living wage for everyone and universal basic income, now would be the opportunity. We're basically seeing the universal basic income part right now. Um, yes. sort of with the Canadian Emergency Workers Benefit. They change the name every few days. So I'm not sure what it's called right yeah. now, but um, there's that coming out. And um, I think if we can tie that in with um, living wages, that would be, uh, this is the time to do that, I think. Is it? Oh, I, th I think it is. Go ahead. I think one of my council colleagues said that on Twitter or something that talked about the importance of how we have to be thinking about how, why is it during the crisis we're thinking about these social programs that we need and have always talked about needing and to support our community? And someone accused her of being political during uh, during the crisis because that's a political discussion to have. Well, and, <laughs> are you politicizing the crisis, Nathan? Well, I think it's just like obviously we're in the crisis right now, but we know the importance of these programs clearly. Um, so, but Further, we're going to have to talk about how we pay for this. So right now we're just sure. piling up debt, which is okay in the short term. But these programs are important. We see they're important. So how are we going to pay for this 
in five, 10 years. We need to yeah. have that conversation, I think. <laughs> Maybe not today, but soon. I hope that we also have a conversation about um, how much we pay people with disabilities, because I know the federal government has upped the amount by, I believe it's approximately $300 for people with disabilities, but it's a fair point that you, you give working people $2,000 and yet people with disability are expected to live on far less. And it's saying that someone who works is far more valuable than someone with a disability. And I think it's completely unfair that they come out with a living wage for people that work and yet people with disabilities are, are still left to just survive on their own. And I don't think that's fair because whether you're working or you're disabled, you should still make the same amount of money. You should still be treated the same. And it, even if it's not intentional, it comes across that people with disabilities are less valuable to society than people who work. And that's how it looks when we pay them less. And that's something I hope we have a better conversation about and something happens moving forward because I'm happy the federal government did act and at least give another $300 to the subsidy, but I think it should absolutely be equal. Oh, they, they totally called themselves out, didn't they? When they, when they started talking about means testing and started talking about, well, if you, yep. if you don't have this much money, you need more money to survive. It's like, well, how come you haven't been worried about that till now? That's that you, they totally called themselves out on yeah. that. So do you think, yep. are you, are you hopeful we're going to have that conversation after this? Do you think, do you think this is actually, I mean, I think we all kind of hope we're all kind of in the same political mindset. We all kind of hope we're going to have a better discussion about that. But do you, do you think it's going to happen? What's the process that's, that's, that, that'll happen here? I'm not sure. I'm certainly going to fight for it. It's something that I was surprised to see in the media and actually start to get a bit of traction. It's something that uh, people with disabilities like myself have been active about for years and trying to bring attention to it. The fact that it got any media spotlight, I think, was surprising, but very good. So I'm certainly going to try to take advantage of that and keep bringing it up in the public's eye and, and trying to keep... Um, bringing more attention to it and, and getting some more support. Um, it's something that isn't going to be probably discussed in full for quite a while, just because there's such a focus on what's happening with COVID right, right now. And it's kind of a, yes, okay, that issue came up. We'll deal with that later. When later is, mm -hmm. I don't know. None of us know. But I'm hoping that at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, we will come back once, you know, We've hopefully um, diminished the curve and, and we've gotten to a place where we're kind of in control of this. Um, we can start having some of those conversations that have, that have come up as we've tried to deal with this ongoing crisis. We can actually take a step back and go, okay, let's start having conversations about things like living wage and uh, how much people should get when they're living on disability. Hopefully we can take a step back and have those conversations, but that's not going to happen until we're a lot further along and a lot safer. Yeah, so um, this is a really good discussion and cognizant of the time as well. Yeah. Uh, we're probably nearing the end of the conversation, I would, <laughs> yeah, I would sorry. think. So. No. no, no, this is really good, um, but I get to play the, the moderator. <laughs> How, who made you moderator? <laughs> so, so tell me something. So, okay, yeah, yeah, we're getting, let me get a couple, couple more questions in. Tell me something that's going on outside of City Hall in your community. What, what, is there anything that's going good in your community outside of City Hall that, that you see? What's your community doing that's interesting? How are they adapting I guess I can, do the, I can do the Langley one. So, yeah. um, I mean, obviously there's the celebration of health workers that happens at 7 p.m. But even beyond that, it's the call of helping out because we have a, a large seniors population, low income seniors population, and many people haven't been able to go out even before COVID because they just aren't mobile. So there was a call that came out from the Langley um, Senior Society because they have a phone-a-friend program. And sometimes they've had problems filling that. So that's where you call a, a senior and have a, you know, as a friend once, once a week or I guess more. So they put a call out and like within a few hours, they got it all filled. So seeing that, seeing wow. the like, COVID support pages pop up online, like you need someone to give you groceries or whatever. So seeing that community um, spirit is really heartening. 
Um, also, people here are maintaining social distance or physical distance for the most part. So you go outside, people are still friendly, people are, you know, there's obviously people that are not following the rules, but 90% are. And so it's good to see that people here are, are treating it seriously. So yeah, it's, the weather's been nice too, which is good. So yeah, um, all, all considered, I think it's, I'm really happy that I am where I am right now. Yeah, we've had a pretty good online connection in, in New West. There has been uh, a New West Goes Viral hashtag happens every eight o'clock at night. Someone, someone is nominated to ask a question and people just exchange, um, just ask a question, just to get people talking and communicating with each other and reminding each other uh, that other people exist in the world. And it's questions as simple, you know, what is your favorite documentary movie? Something as simple as that. I think it was tonight's. So what's your favorite musical cool. tonight's actually? <laughs> And uh, it was, it's just kind of nice to see a bunch of, yeah, I see a bunch of online connecting that people are doing in a pretty positive way. Uh, Facebook is still a challenge. I'd still say even Facebook is 75% positive right now. But um, oh, I have a positive news story too. Sorry to interrupt, oh, okay. but uh, here's a, something different that happened that's actually pretty important. So um, the city of Langley has been putting up a rainbow flag now for three years. Uh, someone Yay! put that to the Human Rights Commission, um, but that Aww. person lost. Oh! That person Yay, lost. So the city is allowed to put up the rainbow flag. Um, oh. And also the Human Rights Tribunal um, validated our policy, which says we need to be a religious neutral space. So while we allow people to celebrate their religion, their faith in public, um, we don't put up any religious symbols. And that right. was upheld as something we must do. So... That's oh, something, good. sorry to interrupt, but that's something that's a good new news and different. Story. Good and news that happened a few days ago. That's great. <laughs> yeah, the other thing we have, the, the farmer's market is back. The farmer's market, of course, had to shut down because of social distancing rules, but they were deemed an essential service by the provincial health officer. And, um, and they've basically set themselves up weekly now in a very different structure so that you can't hang out and listen to music and eat in the park as you normally would at the farmer's market. It's very much a show up, get your food, get out. But it has been a really nice connect ability for people to shop, to shop and it's helped out some uh, local farmers and local food suppliers. But they've also integrated themselves better with the, with the um, food bank because the food bank was had a problem. They lost their actual location because they could no longer do socially, because of social distancing rules, they could no longer run the food bank the way they did. So the two organizations are actually working together out of the same place so people can come and use the food bank and then immediately after the farmer's market exists and the, and the credit program that works through the food bank to give people who may not otherwise have means access to the, to the, to the farmer's market uh, is working smoothly with that too. So that's been a really positive. And that took people in the community, people working for the city, people working for not for profits, all kind of working together on a model that, that came together really quickly. So that's a positive story out of out of New West. Kirsten, give us a, one Ridge. positive story out of Maple Ridge. I do have some positive stories. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom or controversial items. Um, so we have uh, a lot of residents that are really stepping up to the plate and are trying to help their friends and families and neighbors. Seeing lots of posts on social media just saying, hey, like, I'm here if you need me to grab groceries for you, if you're shut in. I can go pick up the mail for you, or I can walk your dog, or whatever else you need. Um, offering that not just to friends and family, but complete strangers. Uh, also seeing organizations like um, Youth Foundry, Community Services, and uh, the Ridge Meadow Senior Society uh, stepping up and saying, hey, you know, we can, we can help if you're isolated. We can help connect you to other services. Um, we're still here to support. Or you, we may not have our offices open to the public, but we can take phone calls, which is fantastic. Um, just uh, with regards to the entire community, something everyone's able to do is the Hearts in the Window campaign. And I don't know what that's looking like in other communities. I imagine you're doing it too. Yeah. But I know in Maple Ridge, when I'm walking my dog, um, so many homes have hearts in the windows uh some of them are even lit up some people even have christmas tree lights with hearts which is super cool um and i've seen kids drawing uh with chalk uh hearts as well and positive uplifting messages which is just really beautiful and reassuring that 
you feel less alone and more connected to your community. And, and it just kind of reminds you that, yes, this is difficult, but you're not the only one that's going through this yeah. and that everyone understands how you feel and what you're dealing with and that you're not alone and that you are supported. And it's that beautiful message to healthcare workers and frontline workers that we appreciate everything that you do. We know you're working hard, you're putting yourself at risk and um, we really appreciate everything you do and we wanna support you as best we can. So that's something I think is really beautiful that I've, I've seen in the community is people offering uh, to help their, their neighbors and their loved ones and people just sharing their hearts, literally. Uh, showing their hearts on their sleeves, essentially. Yes. And their windows. Yeah. Yes. So, so okay. what, one, what's, what's your uh, final question, Patrick? One minute. <laughs> Less than a minute, Nathan. Yeah. And this is a hat tip to Jesse Brown in Canada land. Okay. <laughs> what is giving you joy right now? How are you finding joy in your day-to-day -day life right now in this crazy time? Oh, uh, oh want... easy question. Okay, yeah, to Kirsten, go first, you go first. My dog, my beautiful, beautiful baby girl, Nala. Um, she's a husky. She's had an eye infection, unfortunately, this week. So um, she is starved for affection because whenever I take her for a walk, nobody will pet her, one, because of social distancing, and two, because she has an eye infection, so I can't <laughs> let anyone. So my poor little girl is dying for affection. Um, but we give her lots of cuddles and treats and love and, and she wakes me up every morning with a big smile on her face and lets me know she has to go pee. So I get up in the morning, even when I don't want to, <laughs> uh, helps get me, get me sticking to a regular schedule. And then, you know, I take her out for a walk in the morning and in the evening, which I'm going to do after we're done here. Um, and it, it just helps me keep with a regular schedule and keep a smile on my face. Um, and the SPCA is even saying like, hey, if you're in quarantine and uh, you don't have a lot of family, pets are not a bad idea. They're great <laughs> friends in a quarantine. So yeah. just a uh, yeah. hint, hint, nudge, nudge. It's not a bad time to adopt if you want a furry friend at home. All right, Nathan? That's true. Sure, I mean, um, being, being married has become very important uh, to my husband, Rob. I think that's something that sometimes you can take for granted, but definitely super, super critical right now. And I know that there's some people that, again, don't have that opportunity and being able to be with another person is, is amazing. Obviously, a spouse is even more amazing. Um, he's been working his way through this book called Gatto. So that's, it's a cookbook. So it's basically been <laughs> bakery goods every day for the past four weeks. Um, so that's been kind of good. And then speaking about pets, I have a pet turtle who's been staring at me probably wondering why I'm still up because he's trying to sleep. Uh, and that's just an endless source of entertainment. So. <laughs> well, um, yes, it's, it's wonderful to know that I still love my spouse. I, we, we can still spend a lot of time in the house together. She's working from home. I'm working from home. We can still sit in the same house together and, and still, uh, still love each other, which is refreshing. But you know, it's, to me, it's been long bike rides. I've been going out for long solo bike rides by myself uh, um, and just being able to get out on the bicycle. And uh, the weather has been great. I think this would have been a much worse last couple of weeks if the weather hadn't been so nice. Uh, let's knock on wood that it stays nice for a while um, until people get more adapted. But yeah, to me, it's getting out on the bike has been really my, it's been my chance to clear my head. Um, yeah. Well, I think we should go, folks. It's, uh, yeah. it's 10 o'clock. We've had a... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Matthew. I hope <laughs> the kids are in bed by now. Let's all... After we, get off the phone, after we get off this, let's all phone Matthew at home and wake up the kids, okay? That, that sounds, like a, sounds like an awesome plan. Well, it was good talking with you. Kirsten. Yeah. Good talking with you, Patrick. Yeah. Take care. Oh. Oh, oh, isn't that cute? I don't know if you can see <laughs> yeah. her, what yeah, it's like with the camera on, on oh, my phone, but that's my baby girl. Let's see. Yes. I have no pets. <laughs> well. got, okay. Well, good night. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, and let, let's talk. Let's keep in touch because I want to know what your cities are doing and how we keep on going through this. So Sounds thanks good. for taking the time to meet tonight.